So good morning again, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our 11th session in SCAG's Traffic Safety Peer Exchange Series. Uh, we will have one more next uh, next week on August 10th, uh, focused on LA County. Um, so consider registering for that remaining uh, session. Um, my name is Courtney, Courtney Aguirre, as I had mentioned. I am a program manager for public health and safety at SCAG. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers, and her. <laughs> I'll be facilitating today's session along with Ryan Klitsch, a senior associate with Cambridge Systematics, who is one of our consultant supports on this project. Um, if you haven't uh, already, please um, do introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, that'd be great for us. Uh, next slide, please. There we are. So this peer exchange is anticipated to run for about an hour and a half. Um, at this point, all, all participant lines are meant to be muted. If you do have questions, you can type them into the chat box or raise your hand and we'll call on you to unmute yourself during the Q&A. Um, all of our presentations will be emailed to the folks who registered to participate in today's meeting. Um, and they'll also be posted online after the fact. Uh, next slide, please. So as staff at SCAG, I want to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Chumash, the Tongva, and the Keech. As we acknowledge, we are on the original lands of the Chumash, Tongva, and Keech peoples, and how deeply the field of urban planning continues to engage with the land. We want to offer this acknowledgement as a first step to more conversations and actions that will support indigenous communities in thriving. Uh, next slide, please. So today's regionally specific peer exchange is going to include a handful of presentations, all focused on traffic safety issues facing rural communities in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. We're going to be learning about how we can plan for our rural areas um, in, in improving their traffic safety. So our speakers include a traffic engineer from the city of Lancaster, a representative from the Los Angeles County of Public uh, Public Works Department and a Policy and Communications Director from Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. And to wrap up, we're going to have a facilitated um, panelist Q&A and a group discussion where we hope that you can chat more directly with the presenters. And if you do, um, and if you're able to, we'd like to hear what your experiences have been like planning for your communities. Uh, we're especially interested in hearing from you, your reactions to the presentations, and again, your overall experiences, since this will hopefully be an opportunity for you to share your perspectives and learn from one another. Uh, next slide, please. So to start things off, I'd like to share a quick update on our region's existing conditions and our Go Human program. For those of you who are not as familiar with um, different resources that are available for you right now. Uh, next slide, please. So as many of you are aware, our region is vast. It's home to about 19 million people, half the state's population, 13 million licensed drivers. And unfortunately, every year we have people dying in traffic collisions, about 1,500 people. And many, many people are seriously injured. About 5,500 people are seriously injured each, each year in traffic collisions across our region. And we anticipate that as we emerge from the pandemic, <laughs> if and when that happens, we expect that some of these rates of fatalities and serious injuries are going to continue to rise, um, particularly if people are shifting away from use of public transit or shared uh, vehicles. Um, so we do know that, as I mentioned, collisions are happening in every community in the region from Thousand Oaks in Ventura to, um, to Malibu in Los Angeles County. Um, However, we do know um, that many of these collisions, about a quarter of all collisions, are the result of unsafe speed. And this is really important to note um, as the survivability in a collision decreases so significantly with increases in speed. Uh, next slide, please. So this information, a lot of statistics and more detailed analysis is included in our Regional Transportation Safety Existing Conditions Report, which we're going to be linking to in the chat, along with fact sheets that are very specific for each county. Uh, we completed an update of this report just last month, or rather I should say in June, huh, two months ago now, and again it provides that region-wide and county-level um, level of breakdowns for you to consult. 
So in our efforts to hopefully eliminate serious injuries and fatalities across the region, we do engage in a variety of efforts, including these steer exchanges and our Go Human campaign. Uh, next slide, please. So this Go Human campaign launched in 2015 to reduce traffic collisions and encourage more people to walk and to bike. Um, and since then, Go Human activities have expanded the conversation beyond vehicular violence into a whole suite of programs that mainly fall into three categories. The first is co-branded safety messaging materials that you can request online right now on our Go Human website at no cost. They come in different forms like lawn signs, uh, banners, bus shelters, um, just a variety of, of different uh, formats that you can uh, hopefully place throughout uh, your communities. Um, Go Human also offers a kit of parts at no cost. This is a really nifty thing to, to consider using um, in your community. The kit is a set of modular pieces that can be assembled to demonstrate different street design treatments like parklets, bulb outs, and crosswalks. So if you've ever considered um, perhaps a treatment you'd like to implement in your community that you think that folks need to or should experience first, this is a way that you can do that. Um, and finally, we do offer safety workshops like this, webinars at different points, as well as technical assistance um, to our communities, either through our Sustainable Communities Program, our safety grants, and also through our Community Streets Mini Grants, um, which is a funding program meant to build street level community resilience and increase the safety of people who are most harmed by collisions. Um, next slide, please. So all of these uh, resources, again, can uh, you can learn more about on our website, the Go Human website. You can also request materials from us um, online. Um, if you'd like to register for that final safety peer exchange, which I uh, shared at the outset, that's on August 10th, you can go ahead and do that online as well on our website. Um, and just reach out to us um, as you try to make um, uh, advances in your own communities to improving safety because we do want to support you as you do this um, challenging work. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Um, so, so to kick things off, um, we'd like to start by getting a sense of who you are and what you're doing. So the first question, do you live, work, or play in rural Los Angeles or Ventura County? Um, I think Jennifer are, is going to be launching the poll for you in just a second. Um, and then the second question we have for you is, uh, do you feel that the needs of vulnerable populations such as pedestrians, bicyclists, and aging road users, road users are adequately addressed in rural areas, yes or no? Um, so these are a couple of questions, again, that can hopefully shape some of our conversations uh, going forward, and it's helpful for our presenters to know, too, if, um, you know, they're, you're their peers, their colleagues in um, the counties, or if you're trying to learn uh, from us uh, what other counties are up to, and then again, um, if you feel that those vulnerable population needs are being adequately addressed. And so I see the uh, majority of you are actually, it appears, um, working or living or playing in these counties, which is a great thing. So you have a good um, frame of reference for what we're going to be describing. Um, and then two, yeah, um, this, this I don't think comes as much of a surprise to many of us that, that we do need to plan better uh, for pedestrians, bicyclists, aging road users, children, uh, those who are uh, most vulnerable in, um, well, really all areas of the region and within our rural areas. Um, so thank you. And equestrians, I see that's um, an additional point in the chat, um, indeed, especially considering um, right, the rural areas. Um, so thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that poll with everyone. Um, and so uh, now we would like to offer our, our first presenter an opportunity to share their presentation with all of you. Um, I'd like to welcome Rosa Oriana, a traffic engineer from the city of Lancaster. Uh, she has a degree in civil engineering from Cal State Northridge, and she's been working with traffic in, in the traffic engineering field for a total of four years, including her time under the city of Santa Clarita traffic and transportation team, and now as an engineer for the city of Lancaster. 
she mainly focuses on assisting with traffic engineering, traffic safety, and systemic approaches within Lancaster. Uh, welcome, Rosa. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, so I'll be kind of going over a little uh, highlights of our city of Lancaster. And if you guys have any additional questions, always feel free to reach out to me even after uh, the peer exchange. Um, so where is city of Lancaster? Uh, we're located in the northern part of LA County. Uh, we can see that in the top right corner there uh, to show kind of in respect to where uh, LA city is, we're at the top end of it. We're about 645 center miles and a population of approximately 172,000 people. Next slide, please. We are a urban, urban versus rural type um, city. The green area being our city core, which goes from 30th Street West to 30th Street East, and then from Avenue I to Avenue M. Uh, you can see the boundaries that we have there uh, align with the County of Los Angeles and the city of Palmdale. Uh, of, co of course, we have some developed areas on the outer parts of our city core, uh, but as you can see, there are large areas of undeveloped city uh, that still either need some development or are in our rural areas that will remain rural. Next slide, please. For our demographics, about 75% of the community is disadvantaged, uh, and that's with people that who have an income lower than the 200% uh, federal po poverty le level. Uh, we have a median household of about 49,000 and 32 feet of paved road per capita. Next slide, please. Some of the challenges we face here at the city of Lancaster is our transitions between urban and rural areas. So you can see that in the, in the top photo, uh, we have some developed sidewalk and then no developed sidewalk after, uh, coming right after it. Uh, we have open and wide roads creating high speeds, so uh, six lane roads, um, sometimes even bigger. We have pedestrian bicyclist accident rate and high speed roads. Uh, misjudging of oncoming traffic at signalized intersections, so that's our broadsides, our permissive lefts, uh, permissive protected lefts, uh, underdeveloped locations that disrupt connectivity. So that could be narrow roads that cut off our bicycle routes or our pedestrian routes, um, or just uh, undeveloped areas that still need some form of sidewalk or improvement to provide connectivity for pedestrians and bicyclists. Next slide, please. Some of our mitigations are uh, our annual maintenance programs. We have two annual maintenance programs, uh, two of our major ones, which is our annual thermoplastic refresh program. It's a five-year rotating program and it'll refresh our existing and install new thermoplastic. Uh, and then we have our pavement management program, which reviews the pavement index and will prioritize roadways that have failing pavement. Uh, these are our major programs that we like to use in our traffic engineering group as opportunities to provide road diets, buffered bike lanes, um, medians if need be, uh, striped medians, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. One of our other mitigations is multimodal safety. So uh, as stated pr previously, our separated and buffered bike lanes in the top right corner uh, we create these large buffered areas to help create some space in between or a safety zone in between the bicyclists and the um, vehicles. Uh, this is an example of our Sierra Highway, which was originally a three lane in each direction and now has gone down to two lanes in, in each direction. So we help create that side friction for our vehicles, uh, as well as our high visibility crosswalks and curb radii reduction. So this is one of our uh, newer ones is Avenue I and 10th Street West. Uh, this shows our continental crosswalks at the intersection, as well as some refuge areas and that um, curb reduction to help with pedestrian visibility. And we also have our round roundabouts. So we have two major ones, which is our 15th Street uh, East and 15th Street West along Lancaster Boulevard. Uh, this one shows 15th Street East Boulevard when it was first installed. And this has really helped with that intersection 
um, fatal or not fatality, sorry, um, high accident collisions in our city. Next slide, please. Uh, and then this just kind of shows our complete streets mentality. This is one of our major road diets that we did in the city of Lancaster. This is Lancaster Boulevard uh, between 10th Street West and Sierra Highway. So you'll see in March 2009, we had a two lane road in each direction. Uh, and in 2011, we went to our complete streets uh, design, which is part angled parking down the middle of the street. Uh, we have parallel parking along both sides of the street and a one lane in each direction, as well as a bike route through the boulevard. Our speed limit on this roadway went from 35 miles per hour down to 15 miles per hour, and we received a 24% reduction in total collisions along this stretch. Next slide, please. On top of the um, engineering that we do at the city of Lancaster, we're also working on some internal implementation to help with that. Uh, and that would be refreshing all of our uh, policies to create a more systematic approach to our operations to align with vision zero. So that's a refresh of our traffic calming policies, a refresh of our safe routes to school, uh, and re revisiting some of our old uh, city standards and maps to help refresh and create that vision. Uh, one of the challenges here that are not really safety related, but are more, um, more uh, staff related is that we are a small team in Lancaster. So we're small, but very mighty traffic group. Uh, and we try to create processes that are both efficient and effective for our uh, staff members to help with anything that needs to be done for the city of Lancaster. Next slide, please. Some of our major, major funding sources is our uh, Measure R is one of our biggest one this year. And we have um, Measure M, some of our grants, which is like HSIP or ATP, and then our other local funds. So we're about approximately 85% of our traffic projects are um, funded by HSIP or uh, some form of grant, grant or a Measure M. Uh, and not many of our traffic projects are locally funded. So we are heavily um, relying on these funding sources from the state or federal. And we have some of our own challenges within our grants that we're putting together. One of that being, um, next slide please. The HSIP funding uh, with the new LRSP requirements that we have uh, for the new cycle 10 HSIP application. Um, we are currently working with an R, uh, with a consultant, so or not currently working on an RFQ for an, a consultant to put together our LRSP. Um, and some of the major goals that we have for that is to create a systemic approach for the uh, LRSP uh, to be able to utilize it for internal funding allocation. So using those projects for our city council and going to our city council to show that we have these upcoming projects that will need some type of local funding or um, local assistance and ongoing an analysis for future applications. And this just kind of goes back to the whole having a small city and a small group to work with. So really using this LRSP to our advantage and creating that um, help for our team and having that systemic approach for the um, our safety projects. Next slide, please. And as most of us know, uh, a lot of these grant applications require some form of community participation or community outreach. Uh, and here at the city of Lancaster, we utilize our public events to keep current with our community outreach. Uh, here are some of a couple of the events that we've done this year uh, and last year, which is a tour de Luke, see and be seen uh, campaign, our bike repair clinics, uh, scavenger hunt. Uh, we have our wraps that we put on our um, at our signal cabinets to remind residents to see and be seen. Um, we are heavily relying on community education here at the city of Lancaster. Uh, these events have been a great source to remind our residents and constituents to practice safe traffic habits every day. So um, for in our rural locations, we've noticed that education kind of does play 90% of the um, of the part to help with community safety and traffic safety and teaching those of our residents to drive at safe speeds and 
um, look both ways before crossing streets and using the bike lanes uh, properly and um, things like that. So these are just some of the few things that the city of Lancaster has done. These are just highlighted projects. Uh, there are other items that we are doing our best or trying to adjust as we go. Um, but that's kind of pretty much what we're doing here. And if you know anyone has suggestions or any questions about any of the events that we do here, or if you would like to know more about some of our projects, you, um, you're more welcome to reach out to myself or anybody here at the traffic team. Thank you. And that's my contact information if anyone wants it. Thank you, Rosa. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions regarding your presentation. We do have a couple of uh, minutes that we could dedicate. Um, I don't see anything coming through in the chat directly, uh, but one question I have for you, Rosa, about your experience working for uh, the city of Lancaster in a more rural area is um, how, you know, how how what it's been like to engage residents right in planning for these sort of improvements i imagine some of that engagement may be a bit tougher right considering the rural nature of the you know community and i wonder if you have recommendations for how to you know overcome some of that challenge that may come from having less concentrated you know populations and people to reach out to yeah it um it's it's been tough. Uh, we have uh, our team member, Candice, who uh, she does a great job at putting together these events. And um, we've seen a lot of outcome from these types of events. And I mean, like the bike repair clinics of, you know, really showing the community that we're here for them, I think is one of the biggest things that help with, especially communities like ours, where we're very disadvantaged. You don't have the ability to, um, you know, afford for, a bicycle or feel like they're safe to make it around town. And so I think it's um, uh, creating these events and really listening to what the residents have or what they have to say at the events, I think is probably one of the, one of the better ways to help with that. Getting them out to the events is always hard, um, but I think it's just um, showing that the city cares or that the um, agency cares about their community um, really goes a long way, especially in these rural areas. And then one, one additional question I have um, is, is with respect to your paving program, you described it as really um, functioning, it seems, as an opportunity, right, to reassess streets for what more could be done. And I wonder with uh, the city, is that standardized or is that something at this point um, that, that you're proactive about or how you ensure um, that you're reviewing those plans um, and that you're considering, you know, the opportunities there, if there, again, is a standard approach that you have for doing that right now. There are guidelines of some kind. I wouldn't say there's a standard approach. I think it's just more, uh, like you said, a, a proactive approach and just working and honestly communication with other parts of the division. You know, our PMP is um, handled by our capital group, but we do our best to communicate and uh, talk with them and try to um, kind of proactively look at the locations that they're doing so that we can get ahead of it and help them in their design process. So um, I wouldn't say we have any standards on it, but I would just say communication and being you know proactive with the uh, projects and what's upcoming and being aware of what projects are, you know, slated for the year or for the next five years in, in your city or agency. And and perhaps through that local road safety plan that you develop, perhaps that'll, you know, help further re, um, right. define where those improvements could be occurring, mm -hmm. um, right. which is really critical. I'm sure most people on the call are aware of this, but if you're not, um, in order to compete for a highway safety improvement program funds, one of the grant sources that Caltrans offers, you do need to have an LRSP in place in order to compete. I think um, that's effective next year. Uh, for mm -hmm. folks. So you do have time um, and I'm glad to hear Lancaster is developing one so you can remain uh, competitive for that funding source. So um, thank you, Rosa. Uh, we'll um, you know, get back to you in the facilitated Q&A. Uh, but right now I'd like to welcome our next presenter, 
Alvin Lai from the Los Angeles County Public Works Department. Um, Alvin is an associate civil engineer, another engineer uh, within the traffic safety and mobility division of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Works. Uh, he has been with the county for 18 years in various capacities. That's very impressive to me. And he currently oversees traffic investigation studies within the fifth supervisor supervisorial district in response to requests received from the public, which I imagine must be a bit of a challenging task trying to manage all of those expectations. Um, so welcome, Alvin. Um, I'll hand it off to you to share your slides. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alvin, as uh, introduced by Courtney. Um, I'm here presenting uh, traffic safety requests in the LA County communities, especially in the, uh, in the rural mountain communities of uh, uh, the 5th district, uh, where, you know, many rules and mountain area lies. Uh, today, my goal is to provide with an overview of how public work address safety requests in the rural communities of Los Angeles County. Next slide, please. Los Angeles County Public Works, our mission is to deliver regional infrastructure and services, improving the quality of life for more than 10 million people in the Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County have 120 unincorporated communities outside the 80 incorporated cities as, uh, you know, one of which would be Lancaster. Uh, County of Board of Supervisors act as the governing bodies and provide municipal services to these unincorporated areas. And we, Public Works, are the Public Works uh, uh, agencies, uh, you know, assisting with that. Next slide, please. Now, in general, we respond to all traffic safety requests from the Board of Supervisors, uh, the public, the general public, uh, local agencies uh, such as Lancaster's or, you know, any nearby cities, as well as internal requests where, you know, our, our internal personnel, uh, you know, uh, would put in these requests based on what they see uh, when they go out in the field. Uh, one of many ways public work address human center safeties in rural communities is by conducting these studies that comes in, uh, you know, from, from, from the source I just mentioned. And the type of requests we get are uh, stop control, traffic signal requests, speeding concerns, uh, warning signs, parking restrictions, flashing beacons, pedestrians and equestrians mark crossing, embankment guardrail, illegal dumping, and, and all other sources that, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, too many to, to be included in one slide. Uh, next slide, please. Now, once we get these requests, uh, these are the typical study process that we, you know, uh, go through. First, we contact the constituents, uh, the requesters, to clarify the request, like, the locations, the limits, the concern, because many of which are the general public where they don't, uh, you know, quite um, understand what they're requesting uh, uh, in terms of, you know, the engineering world perspective. So uh, we want to clarify it and make sure that, you know, we, we are adequately, uh, you know, addressing their concern. And once we get that, we, you know, we conduct a field uh, review, verified what's existing conditions that's out there at the locations, uh, then we collect data, uh, such as speed, volumes, and et cetera. Um, then we review, then we also, you know, uh, run the collisions, histories, and, and review the collisions uh, uh, data to see, uh, and also conduct analysis. Once we've done that, we prepare a traffic engineering report with recommendations and findings, and then we implement the recommendations measures that we recommended. Next slide, please. Challenges. Uh, for each of the requests, I mean, we, you know, every request we have their own challenges, but some of the challenges we encounter in rural areas uh, uh, are generally, you know, some of which are what maybe conflicting with local community standards. An example of that would be, you know, the, in, in rural areas would be the dark sky provision. Um, and, you know, and how we've been handling that is really uh, a, 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 a great effort of community outreach, uh, constantly communicating with the communities to, 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 you know, to also understand what, what their needs and how we can accommodate that. Another challenges that we encounter is our mark crossing at uncontrolled locations where rural areas tends to have a higher speed 
and the roadway alignments are, are, are much more challenging uh, with restricting visibilities. And typically our implementations, uh, obviously, you know, uh, we conduct the study, like as mentioned previous slide, where we go through every single element and, you know, and uh, some, of, some of the recommendations that might come out of this will be a high visibility crossing, such as continental crosswalk, with uh, with plenty of advanced uh, warning that 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 are permitted in the California MBTC, such as transverse rumble strips, advanced warning signs, and etc. And the third challenge is uh, the third challenge that we encounter are illegal dumping. Now, many uh, rural areas in 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 the North County um, are are not necessarily uh, public road; they're privately owned roadways where we don't have uh, maintenance over. And, and you know to to address that we actually you know work with the requesters as well as law enforcement agencies and local communities to address these requests and you know put up signage with uh, California vehicle code to help enforcing these uh, 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 illegal dumping situations next slide please um, as such I have previously mentioned you know, our agencies do a lot of collaborations with many different other agencies to achieve the goal of public, you know, great public service. Um, Any times we, you know, we, we have locations uh, of any of the requests that I just previously mentioned, uh, where uh, it, it, it has shared jurisdictions with another agency, such as Lancaster or Palmdale in, in the North County area, or even Santa Cruz or whatnot. Um, we, you know, collaborate with these uh, local agencies and, you know, to 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 work on you know, on finalizing the finding and recommendations, as well as the cost sharing aspect and and scheduling to to have these uh, measures implemented. And the other parties that we collaborate with heavily will be the CHP on uh, in regarding to speeding and moving violations related requests. And as well, you know, we also collaborate with the sheriff. Uh, uh, in regards to the parking enforcement and violations related requests. Now, lastly, we, uh, you know, our team continuously work with other personnel within our agencies, uh, you know, to pertain to requests that uh, relate to their expertise. So, you know, it, uh, the requests we might be the first, uh, uh, first. I guess group of, of personnel that takes in the request and we evaluate it, but if it is outside our expertise, we would you know relate it to other uh, uh, you know departmental uh, personnel to actually address these requests on their behalf. Next slide, please. Now, this is my uh, contact information. If uh, anyone lives in the you know mountain areas of SD five, uh, the fifth districts, and if you'd like to actually you know, uh, have any requests, feel free to send me an email or give me a call and I would, you know, go through the, the, the process uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alvin. I cannot express how valuable this contact information slide is yes. <laughs> because <laughs> even my own experience as a practitioner and trying to get a hold of uh, some folks, not LA, not you specifically, it can be yeah. a challenge, you know, to navigate sometimes the information, the websites, um, even nowadays. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you no, know, no. Um, when you're sharing some of the slides and describing some of the challenges that you mm -hmm. have in rural areas, I was reflecting on my own experience uh, traveling in Riverside, Ventura, you know, our region in Imperial too, um, on some of these rural roads and um, how my heart pounds a bit more, you know, when I'm traveling in these areas versus, you know, the, the cities um, because, um, or the more urban and suburban cities because of the lighting issues sometimes, right? And then the two lane highways and it feels like the speed the pressure to speed is on, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, the challenges I think for traffic safety are really um, significant, you know, or can be significant for um, folks like you, right, to try to solve. And I'm wondering, um, it sounds like you, you feel a lot of requests, right, from folks, yes. you know, to help, mm -hmm. right, which makes a lot of sense. And I'm wondering how, how you wade through those requests, right, or how you prioritize them. Um, is there a system for prioritization or is it um, first come, first serve or what's that look like for you? 
Oh uh, well, for you know, like as as you mentioned, it, it is it is uh, you know much different uh, between urbanized and rural areas. I mean, you know, uh, the fifth district is not just primary you know rural areas. We have we have a lot of urbanized uh, locations in you know Altadena, La Crescenta, and and whatnot. But uh, you know, for 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 rural requests, we tend it it's really tends uh, 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 to fall into the the list of requests that I I just previously mentioned in my slide. But um, you know the way uh, you know public works uh, prioritize these requests is really based on the the safety element of these. You know if, if it's safety related, we tend to put it in a high priority than you know in comparison to the non safety related uh, requests. Now uh, it it is a first come first serve basis where you know we 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 usually put a timeline as far as how you know on on each request and how long it would take. Now, obviously, you know, with 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 every agencies out there, uh, there's a there's an element of you know uh, 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 funding restrictions and and the lack of personnel, depending on you know on on on, on what you have to deal with. But for us, no, there's no different. I mean, we have we have uh, you know uh, 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 continuously you know a, a lot of requests more than 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 our staff can handle, and and we you know address all the safety uh, uh, element as soon as we can get a hand on it. Now, obviously, there's still, you know, you're looking at uh, uh, there's there's still a level of backlogs, but for us, uh, you know, we we prioritize based on 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 safety, and secondly, you know, a, a, everything after that. Got it. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, you must be inundated at times. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering um, because you you've had such a significant amount of time, you know, spent with LA. Um, mm -hmm. Department of Public Works. I'm wondering if any of the projects, if there's one in particular that stands out to you um, as one that was particularly meaningful for the community or from your perspective for the safety issues that it addressed. You know, uh, in my 18 years career, I'm pretty much in all in transportation related uh, field. And, mm -hmm. um, and even I took a master uh, in, in, in the field of transportation. So uh, that's, that's, that's what I enjoy. That's what I like to do. Um, mm -hmm. Now, one of, you know, I, I've been in traffic investigation sections for a little over two years. Previously, mm -hmm. I, did, I did a lot of traffic designs, uh, uh, you know, ITS uh, improvements, as well as, you know, uh, 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 signal timing. Now, uh, in my two years uh, experience as a traffic investigator, I, you know, I find, I find, you know, rural um, areas requests uh, are, are slightly different. I mean, obviously with more urbanized, they're, 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 they're very, cons they're all developed. A lot of time is it's the requests are, 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 are based on signals, are based on, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 turnarounds and, and parking related. Where urban uh, uh, areas, I mean, I have never dealt with equestrians as much as I have mm. in the last two years. And one of which uh, I find uh, uh, quite interesting would be, you know, I have a segment, I think approximately two miles and we have a uh, good three and maybe even four equestrian crossing, existing equestrian crossings. And as you mentioned, I mean, when, oh, in uh, you know, rural mountain areas, uh, speed tends to be a little high. And 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 you know we when we put these uh, mark crosswalk, uh, you know we want to we want to look at safety as as our one priority, our number one priority, and and, and we try to address that. Like as I previously mentioned, we uh you know we, we looked at all the the crossings and we make recommendations to to enhance them with safety measures such as you know rumble strips, thermal plastics, rumble strips, so that it, it won't be pop up as easy as the as the dots that that. That we have previously installed, and um, you know, in addition, you know, we we, we put up uh, a way advanced message sign based on the the 85th percentile speed, uh, to, you know, to, to to advise motorists to slow down because there's a you know crossing ahead. And but then you know, even with all these measures, you know, there's there's an element of of you know of unpredictable. I mean, horses. Uh, uh, you know, might react differently with 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 lights, with all these signage, and so all the measures we put up, uh, you know, we we want to be a little more considerate and, and 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 try to address all aspects of things. So to me, that that project is uh, at least that uh, 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 you know studies that we did, it's it's quite um, interesting and 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 it's a little much eye opening because you know in the past I've been always dealing with with signals with uh, you know with 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 cars, but now I'm dealing with horses, and and it's 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 a it's a game changer to me, 
personally. Yeah, no, that's fascinating to hear about. I think um, in the peer exchanges I've attended so far, this is the first reference to horse um, yeah. that I've heard so far. So I appreciate you sharing um, some of that um, experience. Maybe we can unpack that a bit more in a bit. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. But for now, um, I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker, Lucas Sucker, a policy and communications director from Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. Lucas is the policy and communications director, as I mentioned, uh, at CAUSE. Um, a community-based organization in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties that organizes and advocates for social, economic, and environmental justice for working class immigrant families. Lucas grew up in Oakland and Ventura, California, uh, obviously both in California, and graduated from UC Berkeley with a BA in political economy. He also serves on the City of Ventura Planning Commission. I'd like to welcome uh, Lucas and hand it off to you. Hey, thanks everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, my presentation will be a little bit different from the last two. I'm, I'm not a, you know, agency person. I'm a, I'm a work for a CBO and, and do advocacy. And so kind of on the other end of the, the ecosystem that, you know, that makes, you know, effective change within uh, transportation equity issues possible. And so uh, next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about our, um, our organization. Um, so can we go to the, there we go. Um, uh, so CAUSE is a, a organization that works to advance social, economic, and environmental justice in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. And so we have uh, we have chapters and then offices in, in five different cities throughout the region, Oxnard, Ventura, Santa Paula, Santa Barbara, and Santa Maria, um, and work on a really broad range of issues uh, from uh, immigrant rights to affordable housing, to uh, farm worker rights, uh, to environmental justice and health issues. Um, but really at the root of that, we are a, a community organizing group. And so, you know, there in that picture, you can see that's, a, that's um, some of our youth group. We work with youth as well as uh, adult Spanish speaking immigrants um, throughout, our, throughout our region. Um, and so that, that youth group there is working on, uh, you know, canvassing the neighborhood and collecting signatures um, to improve the safety uh, of, a, of a street that's uh, in, in, the, in the rural farm worker town of Santa Paula. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about transportation equity in rural communities and really, you know, um, talk a little bit more about, about root causes. I think it's easy when we're, you know, deep in the policy to not kind of think about big picture and, you know, what, um, you know, what's behind some of the inequities we face, but really cause works in a lot of communities that are farm worker communities, uh, predominantly Latino immigrant communities um, and, and rural and all of those kind of, you know, intersecting, um, you know, issues result in a lot of, uh, you know, challenges to, to our, our communities actually getting the, the safety that we need, right? Um, and so when you when you think about, you know, why, you know, some of uh, these kind of rural traffic safety issues are, you know, um, are such a problem, uh, you know, sometimes it's because many of the the streets that are, you know, main streets or roads in our, you know, that, that make up kind of the core, you know, what, what a town might might call its main street. Um, you know, in the, the heart of its community are actually state highways and they're, they're controlled by Caltrans, you know, they're, they're used for heavy duty freight trucking, uh, you know, whether that, you know, um, those trucks may be for local agriculture or, you know, from, for the kind of like logistics sector, bringing stuff between port to warehouse to, you know, distribution center. Um, and, um, you know, that often means that our, you know, that our roads don't have the kind of, you know, safety improvements that, that you might do to prioritize people over, say, you know, moving, you know, moving goods for industry, um, you know, and, and even more often uh, kind of our, our, you know, affordable housing. This is true in communities across, across the country and not in just rural communities, but, but affordable housing is often put in unsafe locations. So, you know, we often see, you know, things like farm worker housing you know, put along heavy duty trucking routes, uh, you know, that, that might, the land might be cheaper, might be easier to build, you know, affordable housing in that, in that area than kind of in the, in the center of town, um, you know, in a better, better location. And so, um, you know, we also see many communities, particularly rural um, communities of color, being intentionally left unincorporated. 
um, that you know over over you know many generations you know land use decisions that said we don't want this community part of our city and so we're not going to you know annex it or we're gonna we're gonna leave it unincorporated um, you know and and the resulting lack of often sidewalks street lights you know um, and basic basic infrastructure from from the county um, and I think a lot of this also comes down to you know particularly in, in you know in California but, but funding systems of uh, you know, we've got Prop 13, which, you know, for many decades has, you know, capped our property tax revenue that we could use for some of these, you know, basic improvements and, you know, more affluent communities may be able to tax local tax measures. Uh, you know, Ventura County, um, you know, is, is the largest, largest county in California, the only county in the Skag region that doesn't have a local sales tax for transportation. So, you know, when we're trying to fund transportation safety projects, we don't have that local source of revenue to match in order to get, you know, state and federal funds often. Um, and so particularly low income communities, um, and especially communities that are left unincorporated, but often, you know, small towns as well, just don't have that funding base, um, you know, and, and see our kind of older infrastructure really crumbling, um, you know, and especially without, you know, the, the kind of reassessment of, of property values, uh, you know, over time, and especially in kind of agricultural communities, uh, that would lead to the, you know, kind of property tax revenue to fund fund needed safety improvements. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and so I so I talk about all those you know structural issues to to get at the the reason that we do community organizing, which is that we see those those structural inequities. It's not just a policy problem; it's a power problem, right? The problem is the imbalance of power between you know one community and another which leads one community to get the things they need to, you know, make their children safe from, you know, being something like hit by a, you know, heavy duty truck um, and another community not be able to get those things. And so community organizing is all about shifting that power imbalance and building power uh, where a community felt like it had no power before. And particularly in rural communities, we often don't have large, you know, uh, advocacy groups uh, that are well-funded and resourced, you know, the way you might in kind of urban Los Angeles. Um, and so we're really needing to build, you know, community organization from the ground up. Um, and so this is our approach, you know, often, often in a, you know, a community where we might have a, have an issue like, you know, hey, this, this, you know, street is unsafe here. You know, we might conduct initial outreach, uh, you know, getting a, a group of people to go and knock on doors, you know, on, through the block in the neighborhood, collecting signatures and petitions. And on that petition, we might have a box that says, you know, would you like to get more involved in this issue? Ask people, hey, will you sign a you know, sign a petition to, you know, ask the city to, you know, make some, some safety improvements to the street, you know, a kid got hit by a, by a truck just the other day, um, you know, and, and hey, would you be interested in, you know, checking this box so we can keep you updated about maybe meetings on this issue? Um, you know, the people who might check that box, who, you know, we might have good conversations with, we then follow up with to identify those kind of key leaders in the community who want to get more involved. We might ask them to host a house meeting, invite, you know, at least not during a pandemic, invite their friends, neighbors, coworkers, you know, to their home to learn more about the issue. Um, and from there, you know, ask those people to, to host a house meeting, right? I mean, through that process, we, we build a committee of people who are, who are willing to come to kind of regular meetings and start doing sustained work that it'll actually take because we know these, these projects, you know, often take many months, you know, even, even years to, to get done. Um, and we need that kind of long-term core committee that's gonna, you know, going to kind of speak on behalf of their neighborhood. Um, next, we often, work to demonstrate our people power. While we have momentum and a lot of people involved, you know, go to a public meeting, you know, a city council meeting, county board of supervisors meeting, show up, have a lot of speakers during public comment, right? You know, really demand change from our decision makers. And often that results in, you know, a meeting with decision makers, whether that be the elected officials, you know, their district representatives, someone like that, or maybe the staff members from the agency, you know, that might follow up to meet with us, you know, but sitting down to kind of talk about, you know, those, those details. And often in those meetings, I'll, I'll be honest, what we are told by agency people or elected officials is what you want is impossible. Maybe because of jurisdictional issues, maybe because of funding issues, um, you know, but what we find, and maybe some of the, <laughs> the agency folks here might, might not like me saying this, is if you create enough noise and have enough people, uh, you know, often a solution will be found. You know, you'll be told, you know, there's not enough funding initially, but somehow some funding will be found. It might be, you know, applying for a grant through the Safe Routes to School program that might, you know, get you know, get funding for a project where there was no funding before, you know, it might be getting something inserted to, you know, a, a you know, bike pedestrian master plan that, you know, that, that kind of 
you know, it, it, that plan was done a while back and this wasn't made a priority, but, you know, but people are saying this is a priority, so we need to, to kind of bump it up. It might be, you know, using state greenhouse gas, you know, reduction fund funds that are prioritized now for disadvantaged communities, um, you know, getting it, you know, included in the, the package for, you know, for kind of a next, you know, sales tax increase, right? Um, but somehow, you know, when, when you create enough political pressure, you know, decisions are, are able to be found. And I say that not to, you know, bash on, on, uh, on local government because, you know, local government does important and underfunded work, but to say that often our small community groups in a rural community feel like they don't have the policy expertise. They feel like they don't know how to engage in the policy process or, you know, feel stupid when they go to a meeting and are told that what they're, you know, what they want for just safety for their families isn't, isn't possible and they don't understand the process. And so, you know, what we tell people is you're not stupid. You're not, you know, you decisions are made often based on power and you don't have to understand all of the policy you know you don't have to be a, have a master's in urban planning you say what you need and it's the policymaker's job to kind of figure out how to make it possible next slide please um so since i think most of the people you know here on this uh you know on this zoom are are for public agencies you know and, and often ask us you know how do we you know incorporate some of these strategies how do we you know how do we reach the public you know, reach communities of color, reach disadvantaged communities, reach folks who are not engaging in the process. Um, you know, I want to share some of our outreach strategies because what we do is hard and it takes work and it takes funding, but it's not rocket science. Um, uh, you know, these are some of the things that we do to reach hard to reach neighborhoods. We, you know, door-to-door uh, -door canvassing in a, in a particular neighborhood, uh, phone banking, you know, especially during, during some time like a pandemic of, you know, might be, might be registered voters or, you know, people on a list, um, you know, from previous engagement. Uh, you know, hitting those high foot traffic areas uh, that might be a, a local grocery store or something like that, that in key neighborhoods, um, you know, a, 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 you know, an ethnic grocery store, if you're, you know, trying to kind of reach a, a certain, certain, you know, uh, population, right? Um, engagement in schools, uh, often in immigrant communities we work with, you know, it's the kids, the, the, you know, the ones who are, you know, born in the U.S., or, you know, and speak fluent English, they're the ones who have to do a lot of the translating and interfacing with government agency for their, for their parents and families. Um, you can host focus groups of underrepresented populations if we're like, hey, our bike and pedestrian master plan is, you know, our city's 50% Latino and 90% and of the people showing up to this bike and pedestrian master plan, you know, meetings are, are white. Uh, how could we do focus groups of the folks that we're not, you know, not getting part of our thing and they provide a little gift card or something like that for people to participate. Targeted media partnerships with ethnic media or, you know, Spanish language media. Um, Targeted social media ads. This is one of the things I often recommend to agencies is, you know, it's a really easy way. It's very easy, for example, say to, you know, target Spanish speakers in the city of Oxnard on Facebook with an advertisement about, uh, you know, about something going on. Do you want to reach people extremely cheap, extremely high bang for your buck? Um, because Facebook knows if people are using their, you know, their platform in Spanish, for example. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I just wanted to end with, you know, uh, uh, you know, on a positive note, this is a, this is a story of, this is a, a farm worker housing complex called Via Victoria that was built in the city of Oxnard. Classic, it was built totally on the outskirts of town, you know, um, because that is often where affordable housing projects can actually get approved. Um, you know, major, you know, several hundred farm worker families living there, um, you know, built along a street where you have heavy duty trucking from the port and from, uh, from local agriculture. Um, there were no sidewalks, no street lights, no yellow bus, school bus service, um, you know, to, to the site. Um, and after it was built, unfortunately that land use decision meant we had to do years of work with the residents of that uh, complex to advocate for, you know, the things that, the, that they needed with the city, with the school district. Um, you know, but you can see here, we got that stoplight, we got sidewalks on the street, you know, we, we got, uh, you know, bus service from the local transit district, and then we got yellow school bus service, and that was the last thing. Um, you know, and here you see the, the school bus coming to, you know, pick it up. And this is a, a picture that I, I took here. Um, you know, the, uh, I, was, I was kind of like, see behind this car, people probably thought I was like a pedophile or something, uh, taking pictures of, of uh, you know, this, um, the, the school bus service starting, but, you know, these kids were out here waiting for the, the school bus uh, to come. Um, you know, and it was, of course, running late, and they were like, hey, is it even coming? And, you know, was this real? What well, we were told, you know, is the school district actually starting service? And, you know, there it is, rolls up late, you know, the, the you know, a kid shouts, yes, it is coming, right? Um, and here's this, this school bus that, you know, it's, it's all the more empowering because it wasn't just the school district that did it, 
it was the parents within this, you know, complex, you know, within this community that advocated to make it possible. Um, and, you know, and these are the, the kids that benefit in a very real way. So they didn't have to kind of walk along this dangerous route to get to school. So that's my presentation. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you uh, for sharing this, this, I mean, this meaningful presentation with us. And I think for ending on sort of an uplifting, um, you know, slide, a success story, right? I think those are the things we love to hear more about um, because the work, it sounds like, and I, I'm sure it is hard at times, right? Um, to, to sustain yourself, to sustain um, your organization members and the communities um, to persist, right? And so I'm wondering, because we do have a lot of practitioners on the line, you know, and who have presented, if you have any recommendations, I know you shared a slide with recommendations on how we can do this work, right? But I think part of it is, right, partnering with agencies, organizations that are doing the work already. And and I think you identified too that there are gaps in our communities, right? There are places that aren't organized, unfortunately, and that need the support. And so I'm wondering if you have recommendations for the practitioners on how they can better work with organizations like yours in doing this work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so many things I could say here. Um, I would say, especially in rural communities, as, as you mentioned, Courtney, you know, there are gaps, right? There are often lacks of, of organizations in our region. And the organizations that there are, I mean, the work the cause does, you know, I mentioned all the different issues we work on, right? You know, those would each be a different organization or multiple organizations in, you know, in urban LA, right? Um, you know, but it's like we've got one organization covering all these different issue areas. So, so often, you know, the organizations that exist are small. They might have one staff member, or no staff members, or they might be decently sized like us, but be stretched between a lot of different issues. And so, you know, we're often very strapped for time. I think, you know, the more early and out, uh, early and often that kind of outreach can happen about, you know, public engagement processes, you know, helps us work it into our work plans. Um, you know, I think also, you know, funding is really important, right? If, if you're expecting, you know, community organizations, I mean, I mean, agencies spend a lot of money on consultants sometimes, right, to, to you know, come in and help with community engagement processes and often are reluctant to do that same, you know, funding for the CBOs that are really, you know, the ones who can best engage those hard to reach, you know, populations. And so I think that's that's really valuable. But there may be what I often find, you know, sometimes in rural communities is, is there are agencies that come to us and say, hey, we're looking for somebody in this community that, that we can fund. We're actually happy to give you money to participate in the process, but there's no organization to be found, even that you could give the money to, or it's so grassroots, it doesn't have a 501c3 status and, you know, it can't, you know, can't administratively accept the money. Um, and so that's where I sometimes, you know, shift to those outreach strategies and say, hey, you know, you don't, we don't have to be the gatekeepers to communities. You can, you know, agencies can actually, you know, do this work directly. You can hire a community engagement specialist. You can hire a public information officer, you know, who's going to do some of this, this engagement work as well. Um, but I, I think also, you know, just speaking to working with, with community members and, you know, as, as you spoke to Courtney, it's, it's so hard to sustain the work and, and, you know, people can often become discouraged and often these processes are long. And I think, you know, it's really important for those community members to be sustained for the long run because often, you know, the momentum in a neighborhood of feeling like we can change something might only last a month or two when a, a process to actually get something done at the government level can last a year or two, right? And so how do you how do you bridge that gap? And I think, you know, keeping in communication with those neighbors is really critical, making people feel like they didn't just speak to a brick wall. I think there's actually someone human on the other end who's staying in touch with them and the progress is being made, however slow it might be, you know, I think, I think really helps people. I think part of the reason why people often don't show up to the public meetings is they feel like things have already been baked before the meeting and, you know, the, the kind of process is just a box checking exercise, right? Um, and so, you know, having that personal touch, I think is really critical, you know, especially in a, in a small rural community where, where that, that kind of thing really matters. Um, and so keeping people engaged and feeling like there's, there's progress being made, even if it's slow, um, is, is so, so important. Yeah, it sounds as though there are real opportunities for capacity building in many of these Definitely. communities. And as you're describing, um, perhaps our local agencies can consider investing in engagement specialists, you know, if, if organizations don't exist to do this work, right? And I think some of the work that Alvin was describing too, um, my experience with traffic calming treatments at least, is that sometimes they're a little bit more immediate and satisfying for communities because right. paint, right, is a little easier, right, than a larger infrastructure project. So for helping people um, understand that things can be done. 
um, in a more <laughs> expedient way than right what you're describing yeah. is when you're building you know that more significant project and how do you sustain and communicate throughout right what the process is going to be and why this is a part of the process and you know it's 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 hard it's hard totally. it's, yeah it's really tough I wonder um, if there are any questions that have come in through the chat I know sometimes people message them directly but I also wonder if Alvin or um, Alvin, if you have any questions you'd like to pose for Lucas or vice versa, this could be a conversation between agencies and panelists. Uh, sometimes that does happen, um, you know, and I think, uh, I, Rosa, you're still there as well. Great. <laughs> so I wonder, Rosa, if you have uh, questions as well, um, you know, for each other really about how you're doing the work since it's so significant, it's so challenging. And again, the rural issues, you know, you do have, you know, um, some shared experience Experiences, whether it's through, you know, the, you know, higher speeds, uh, through your reach to equestrian users, um, or to trying to find those organizations to engage with, which is why it sounds like Lucas has been describing for us um, today. So I wonder if any of you have questions for one another, or um, if any questions have come through uh, for Ryan, I know um, you're co-facilitating today, or through Anna, anyone else? I don't see anything that's come through. <laughs> um, but Ryan or Anna, I wonder if you have um, any questions for the panel too. I feel like I've been certainly occupying um, a lot of their time. Yeah, I'd like to kind of continue the conversation uh, Lucas um, was, was kind of hitting on about how to really approach and engage the you know underrepresented populations and actually because I have found to get them into those public forums, community meetings, just even getting them there, you know, maybe they don't work the traditional nine to five, you know, job and these meetings are eight o'clock at night. And, mm -hmm. You know, what, what is something uh, MPOs, local government, you know, uh, transportation departments could do to um, better engage and, and get their input really on, on transportation safety in their community? Uh, great. Yeah, I would say one thing to do is, is even kind of flip the paradigm a little bit, you know, and we always think about how do we get people here? Or how do we get people mm -hmm. to us, to the meeting, right? And, and you know, we, we do the basic things of provide translation, you know, uh, you know, maybe make it, you know, at an accessible hour, at an accessible location, near a bus stop or something like that. Um, you know, and that gets part of the way, I mean, remove, remove some of the barriers, but I think, you know, we got to remember, you know, particularly when we're talking about racial or class inequities, you know, we're, we're dealing with you know, centuries of disenfranchisement and, and you know, it's not going to change with, a, you know, a few weeks of, of kind of concerted engagement. And so, you know, how do we try to overcome that? And I think one of the best ways is how do we go to people rather than trying to get them to come to us, right? Um, and so, you know, whether that's, hey, we really need to do really focused outreach in this particular neighborhood that's really impacted here, right? Um, or, you know, let's get, you know, do a focus group. We're actually providing people with some, some gift cards or something to participate, you know, of a population, you know, whether it's youth or Spanish speakers or something, right? Um, one of the things, uh, you know, I, I often recommend is even doing kind of like a mini, you know, public, uh, public forum or something focused on a particular community. For example, you know, if this is a particular neighborhood in the city that's probably, say, Spanish speaking and, and um, you know, and doing, doing a, a outreach session that's actually in Spanish, you know, as the dominant language, um, you know, in that neighborhood at a location everybody knows and, you know, the local school or something like that, um, you know, and, and that can feel so much more comfortable, even when you have interpretation, you know, going to the meeting where you're the one person is in the back with the headphones on and you feel like you kind of are causing an inconvenience. And then kind of the, just the intangible of like feeling like, oh, I'm speaking, but I'm going to sound dumb. And, I don't, you know, people here seem to know what they're talking about. And I should just, you know, like not, not say anything, right? Those things just weigh so heavy on people that I think, you know, those types of outreach can, can make a big difference. And so like, how do we go to people rather than, you know, than try to get them to come to us? That's great. And then I uh, continue that point, you know, Rose and Elvin, um, what, what's been your experience with kind of the engagement um, with, with the, the general public and, and making sure that it's inclusive for all members of, of the community. Um, what are some examples that, that you've utilized in, in your, your work? Rosa, you want to go first or you want me yeah, to? I can. Oh, 
um, that, you know, our, our community is kind of what Lucas is describing of having that, um, we have like, you know, different types of, um, you know, we have our east side, our west side, our disadvantaged uh, areas are, you know, more, um, uh, what we, what, if you want to call it, like our nicer areas and areas where maybe we have more disadvantaged communities and, um, you know, where they cluster. And so uh, what we've done, especially with our safe routes refresh, is really worked with a consultant who is familiar with working with our community and our different types of community um, and working with a consultant who is familiar with that outreach, who knows um, the ins and outs of working with the community and knowing who to go to to get the most participation from our community at these events and where it should be done. And um, they've been kind of a big help uh, as a consultant that we brought on to um, adjust. And we've also done which is something I thought was really interesting that for our Safe Routes to School Refresh is bringing together a consultant like Lucas and having them kind of marry together with an engineering consultant. So um, someone like Kimley Horn or, um, you know, Stantec, whoever it may be, and having the two work together to create these types of uh, projects for us and what's, you know, needing having the best of the community outreach consultant and the best of the engineering consultant to kind of put them together. So that's kind of what, one of the examples of what we've done out here at the City of Lancaster. I don't know if Matt, um, who's on here also from our team, has anything in addition to include, but that's kind of one of the things that we've done here. No, this is Matt uh, Simons, a city traffic engineer for the city of Lancaster. Um, no, I mean, I think what El, uh, Rosa was saying is is very, uh, very true and very powerful that you get both the people who can help bring the individuals out for the public that can so you can get the stakeholders points of view, but then you also have the um, engineering back, you know, engineering support, I guess, for lack of a better word to be able to kind of put that into uh, formulation and so you can put everything together and you're not promising something that you can't achieve or you're not providing something that people don't want. You're kind of getting the best of both worlds where everybody kind of comes together and it's a lot more, um, um, it's more of a compilation between, um, you know, hard science or hard engineering and the softer stuff that people would actually enjoy and will use. So it's beneficial in both ways. Um. All right, now my turn. Uh, <clears throat> now in, in terms of LA County, the unincorporated counties, I mean, I, I, I gotta give credit to our, you know, local town councils, really. Like they, they you know, uh, a lot of communities, uh, you know, get together and create a, you know, a, a, either a town council or some kind of community, uh, 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 central point to outreach, uh, you know, and speak for that little, uh, you know, specific areas. And what we have been doing is we attend a lot of these meetings where we, you know, the, the town council would host and we would, you know, be there and provide, uh, you know, our inputs, our, you know, our projects that we're doing in the areas, as well as what's, you know, taking in uh, 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 requests that they might have. And, you know, that, that covers, Quite a lot of um, you know uh, residents in 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 our um, our communities. However, like in additions, I think I think you know uh, the county have been uh, doing this for quite many many years, and we have a history of knowing you know how each group of areas and you know who are the representative within that areas, and we actually you know uh, uh, a lot of time reach out to these group of leaders to assist us with the community outreach because you know a lot of time is uh, in rural areas uh, it's not it's really um, homes are really scattered and you know uh, sometimes we do mellows we do a lot of other outreaches but but you know we we try to engage our town council um, to assist with providing that community outreach and having that, you know, they, they usually have either bi-week, bi-monthly or monthly meetings. So, so that is a great uh, resource that we tapped in with. Thank you, Alvin, for sharing that and Rosa as well. Um, and I think, you know, in the pandemic, Ray, I assume those meetings, Ray, are remote um, in some cases, right, Alvin? Um, or 
online, which I know can be a challenge because of broadband accessibility, yeah. right? So that presents a whole other crop of issues, right? But I think uh, one thing that came to mind um, when Rosa was uh, describing their Safe Routes refresh is something that I've seen in more recent years when we're reviewing um, consultant proposals, because a lot of work that cities do is consultant. You know, we, we seek the support of consultants to do the work and it can be grant funded and it can have specific timelines, but something that's making the proposals far more competitive now is if they are proposing to partner with or provide stipends to CBOs. So, um, you know, that helps, you know, bridge, you know, that, that outreach, you know, the, the challenges that come, can come with doing some meaningful engagement and outreach is uh, partnering with, you know, the CBOs. But I think that gets to something Lucas was hinting at as well. That you have the challenge with 501c3s or, you know, if you have the status, right, to actually uh, partner with. And sometimes I think the cons partnering with a consultant or being a part of that team can help, you know, them be a part of the work. So, you know, investing um, in the CBO partnerships can certainly help. Um, and then uh, one additional piece, I think that just gets back uh, to what Lucas was describing that when you engage people and you want them to, you know, experience hopefully um, an end result, something that is satisfying for them, right? And we described how traffic calming projects can be a little bit more satisfying because of their timelines. Um, something else to do with your grant applications is include, um, or not your grant applications, but your contracts with consultants is require that they develop a grant proposal as a part of the plan so that you get, you know, hopefully that funding to do the work. And again, that's a timeline, but at least it's something, I mean, it can extend your timeline, but at least it can be maybe a tangible that you can deliver to the community eventually. So those are just a couple of thoughts. And then the final thought I would share for now on my part would be um, how exhausting it can be to <laughs> motivate yourself to get to those meetings, um, even with your neighbors and speaking from personal experience and wanting traffic calming improvements in my own community. It requires a lot of effort, even in pandemic times, to motivate yourselves to be the squeaky wheel, right, um, to try to get those improvements. And so I can't imagine for people who have far more significant issues, right, and concerns in their lives, how much energy that can take, right, to organize and be there at the meeting, right, or try to reach out. Um, and so hopefully we can work together to try to identify, you know, those ways to make it even more accessible for them. And like I think Lucas was describing, go to them directly as much as we can so that you can cut out, you know, that amount of energy they have to expend trying to reach us, right? Um, I don't know if that stimulates any comments from you, Alvin, Rosa, Lucas, any uh, remaining thoughts to share or anything uh, from the folks who are here with us on the call? Um, any, any additional uh, concluding thoughts for, for our discussion today? You no, know, Courtney, just as you were pretty pleased to mention, I mean, you know, um, our headquarters are in Alhambra and, you know, a lot of our North County, at least, uh, you know, uh, meetings in these rural areas, I'm talking about maybe, you know, pre-pandemic, it takes about an hour and a half just to get there. And, but then, you know, being there and, you know, listening to the constituents uh, in person and, you know, getting, getting to know them and getting to know their their, uh, their concern is very rewarding. And at least, you know, we, there's an element, uh, uh, a human element in that, that, you know, I feel their, their, their concern and their needs. And therefore, you know, we, you know, we tried our best to address it. And there we have, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Alvin. And Rosa, any concluding thoughts from you or Lucas? I don't think so. I think we <sighs> pretty much touched everything that we deal yeah. with in rural communities. Hmm. Hey, Courtney, this is Arnold. Could I share something at the last second? Of course, Arnold works for SCAG. Uh, <laughs> um, unless, Lucas, you have any concluding thoughts, I want to offer that to you now. Okay, yeah, Arnold, go for it. I know you um, are familiar with our rural communities, very familiar. So go for it, Arnold. I'm Morgana, thanks. But I, I'm the regional affairs officer covering San Bernardino County and Western Riverside County. And I was attending a California City's public health event uh, last week. and one of the things that uh, the presenters mentioned was the uh, use of pomatoides out in the eastern Coachella Valley. And it had a lot to do with the whole pandemic outreach though, but they were talking about how because everybody knows them in the community, 
when they called a meeting for vaccinations and information, that people showed up because they know them. And I think everybody said that already. I was kind of half listening and doing some other things. But I thought the example, I mean, so now I asked the question to the group, is there space for SCAGs, near, you know, long range, 2045, 2050 planning? Didn't really get an answer for it. But, you know, kind of mixing these public health things with the planning things, we can somehow synergize all that. Maybe people are talking about that. I think that comes to mind. Anyway, that's what I wanted to mention. Thanks. No, no, that's an excellent model to follow. Um, the Prematura model um, that I think has uh, different terms now that folks are, are using to describe it, but how do you, you know, build capacity right within um, community champions uh, to, to support and advocate for their communities, right, and to function as a bit of a bridge uh, between an agency, for example, and um, the community. Uh, um, any, thank you, Arnold, for sharing that. that that's a definitely a helpful model to explore. Um, Again, I, I know we're reaching time. Um, I don't know if anyone else has comments to share or concluding thoughts they'd like to share with uh, the group. Um, if not, um, and I can pause certainly, um, but I know we're entering that witching hour, lunch hour, I should say, um, and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I know that there were questions at the outset um, if this recording or if the presentations would be shared uh, with you all, and they will be in a thank you email, we'll be hyperlinking to the PDF and we'll be posting online um, the recordings as we've done for nearly all of the sessions so far. So I don't know if Jennifer from AV, our AV support today can share the final slides with you. I think we have a handful of links that we can um, highlight again in the chat as well um, to again, remind you of where you can register for that final session that's focused on Los Angeles County specifically and where you can access the recording um, going forward. Um, and again, you'll be um, sharing, you know, uh, we'll be sharing those presentation slides with you there. Um, and so I want to thank you for taking the time. I definitely want to extend um, the deepest gratitude to our presenters today. Rosa, Lucas, Alvin, I deeply appreciate the expertise and insights you shared about your work in our rural communities. I appreciate how challenging it can be. Um, and I want to thank you um, from me to you <laughs> for being a part of the discussion today and for your hard work in these communities. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any follow-up questions, I know that um, you can reach out to our presenters or me and I can connect you with them. And we hope um, that you stay safe and healthy and perhaps we can see you again at our final peer exchange next week on August 10th. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks everyone.